Welcome to the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Before we begin tonight, I would like to take us a moment in silence for Mary Layden and Lucy Ward. They both passed away about two weeks ago. Thank you very much. Um, in the beginning, let's start with our curator's report by Christine Gustafson. Chris Gustafson, Vice President of the Shrewsbury Historical Society. Curator Linda Davis reported that she's been cataloging the Robert Cormier collection of research. She also provided access to yearbooks for the Beale School History Wall and assisted with research on Dr. Brigham. Two new filing cabinets were purchased for archival storage of collection items. Thank you. Also, our treasurer's report by Christine Gustafson. Treasurer Ann Folan reported that our expenses have been paid, including utilities, oil, postage, and the purchase of the two filing cabinets. We made a donation to St. Mary's Church in memory of Mary Layden, and we received a thank you note from Mary's family. We sent flowers to the Ward family in memory of Lucy Ward, and received a thank you note from them too. We're also very grateful to members of the society and the community who made contributions in Lucy's memory. Thank you. Thank you. Shrewsbury Historical Society's January 2021 presentation. Tonight, it's Den Homes, Worcester's Finest Department Store by Chris Sawyer. Christopher Sawyer is an independent creative director who has spent over 20 years in the luxury section of the retail market he has worked for Neiman Marcus. He is also an author and historian on the Den Home and McKay Company and has amassed the largest collection on Den Homes memorabilia to carry on for future generations. Chris, could you please uh, talk to us? Yeah, thank you thank so you. much for having me. You know, it's I'm so used to doing these things in person where I can do questions and answers, you know, but it's so nice to have these Zoom meetings. I think it's the, well, this is the first one for 2021 that I've done, you know, but we did a couple of them last year and it's it's really nice, especially for the older population. It brings back good, good memories, you know, especially during a trying time like this, you know, so it's nice to have a feel good moment. Well, welcome everybody. You know, it's so nice whenever I get the moment. Um, to be able to take a walk down memory lane with Den Homes. And it's probably one of the most passionate um, subjects in my life for me ever since I was a young kid. And my grandmother first showed me her collection of Den Homes memorabilia from working there for 27 years. And since then, it's been probably the most amazing journey that I've been on. I've met the most lovely people, and I love, you know, being able to bring back memories of shopping at Den Homes, um, a time when the downtown was vibrant. Um, and it gives us all a chance to kind of, you know, jog those old memories that um, people had of shopping at Den Homes. So I hope that, you know, this presentation does that for you. Just some fun facts about, you know, the Den Home building. Um, when it's the first uh, building in Worcester to be powered by electricity as well as powering the South Main Street area. And, you know, we take electricity for granted now, but in um, 1882, when the building was built at 484 Main Street, that was um, Worcester's most modern building. In fact, with the advent of electricity, um, people actually picketed outside the building because they were afraid of what electricity, you know, might do if they went into the building. They just weren't used to it. Um, so, you know, it's quite an interesting fact that, you know, this building was the first building to be powered. Um, it's first escalators in Worcester and the only escalators in existence of their kind. They're actually made from the Otis Escalator Company and they're called the Escalair. Um, for their new profile of the, at the time and being a glass encased um, escalator with all the motoring functions underneath it. Uh, a lot of people have told me that, you know, when the escalators went in in 1963, it was their first trip on an escalator. And someone said as a kid, 
going from the first floor up to the second floor, which would have been women's lingerie when you would have exited. It felt like they were going to the moon. You know, they couldn't believe it. It was so exciting. Um, another fact is that, you know, Den Holmes was the second highest employer at one time behind Norton Company um, and the second largest taxpayer as well for the city. Um, it was the first store in the early 1950s to be air conditioned. Before that, um, the profile of the exterior of the building had lots of windows. Um, when they did the facade change back in 1951, that all changed. And so they ended up putting air conditioning throughout the entire store and actually ran advertising at the time to coincide with it because it was such a novel um, new thing to have in a large structure. And it was the largest store in Central Mass uh, with over five acres of selling space. This is the original um, Denholm McKay Dry Goods, which opened up in 1870. Uh, this was on Main and Mechanic Street. It's actually where the Shacks entrance used to be. Um, and I know you've seen, I think the facade is now down. So we're kind of getting a glimpse of the old structure. Um, you know, before Shacks, it was Kennedy's. It was a lot of things over the time, but that was their first um, selling uh, retail space in the downtown Worcester area. And this is uh, the first picture and the gentleman in the center um, with the two children is uh, William Alexander Denholm. When the store opened, it was really all about, it wasn't a department store. It was really fabrics, trimmings, notions, um, toiletries, you know, people were still making their own clothing at that time. So you didn't even have off the rack. So it was a completely what we would call dry goods, like they put on the front of their building. Um, in 1882, Jonas Clark, um, who was raised in Hubbardston, um, he was in the furniture trade working out in Seattle. And he had heard of the Industrial Revolution going on in Worcester. And he decided that he wanted to come back and start um, his real estate footprint in the city. The first building that he did was at 484 500 Main Street and it was called the Jonas Clark Building at the time. And that was the original facade. He also had a location on um, Front Street and a couple other buildings um, around on Pearl and Elm he had. Um, and when you look at the old Clark University, that was modeled after the 484 Main Street Building, which Den Holmes was on the first floor. and you know, you can definitely see the references between the two buildings. So had the 484 Main Street not had a facade change in the 50s, it would have very much looked very similar to Clark University. This is the Jonas Clark building. This was an early advertising card that was sent out. Uh, you can see it had 40 departments, 400 employees. It was Worcester's greatest store. When the company moved there in 1882, the Denham McKay building only acquired parts of the first floor. Everything above it was doctor's offices, lawyer's offices. You had Becker Junior College in there. You had um, the architectural firm of Earl and Fuller, who ended up doing a 1916 edition, which you'll see. Um, and as offices started moving out, the Denham and McKay company started acquiring all of the upper levels until they had by 1916 fully acquired the whole building. This is uh, Clark University. And if you see this image, you know, compared next to uh, the 484, they're very, very similar. This is another early advertising card from um, before 1900. And you can kind of see what was popular at that time, whether it be cloaks and shawls, morning goods, um, yarns, upholstery goods, um, ribbons, laces, gloves, you know, notions, you know. So it was a very 
it really didn't become what we think of as a department store until probably the late 1920s when um, the whole world started changing with ready to wear and Hollywood coming into play. This was the annex built in 1906 and that was the original on High Street and that's where they originally had the um, shipping receiving area was back there, um, as well as acquired um, space for selling, uh, furniture, carpeting were over on that section, as well as the buying offices. And the original annex had that very narrow corridor connecting the two buildings. Well, over the years by 1916, that had all changed as well as the business grew. In 1916, you can see the um, Knowles building, which was on the left, which originally had Marcus Company in it. Um, it had um, a couple other small lawyers' offices, you know, but Marcus Company was a fur company and at the time. And that's where the Great Fire of 1921 broke out, which really decimated that end of Main Street. And we lost a lot of structures, including um, the Knowles building, which maybe some people will remember. Now it's a vacant parking lot where that and Richard Healy were. Um, but the only reason why the Denholm building was able to, and it was called the Boston store at the time, but it was able to survive that great fire is because it was so advanced with the electrical systems that had gone into place when it was built, as well as all of the steel firewalls that were put in where they could close off sections of the building. And if you are in the building and you go to the third floor, if you were going past what used to be millinery right before the blouse bar, you can see one of the original um, steel walls. It's like a pocket door and it's still existing in the structure. It hasn't been used luckily, you know, but all of these components are really what saved that building as well as the heroic firefighters who leapt on top of the building to make sure any of the sparks or ashes from the Knowles building did not hit the Denholm building. In 1916, um, Frost and Chamberlain did a modernization of the facade. They cleaned up and streamlined the first floor uh, display windows and did three formal entrances. The left entrance was men's, middle entrance connected you into the perfume hall and the right was the millinery department. They ended up also adding an additional sixth floor on top, which is recessed back. Um, and that's what originally was the tea room um, and the employee cafeteria up there. Um, and they also expanded because display windows were really changing at this time and wax mannequins were coming into play. Um, so it wasn't just like a whole fanfare of handkerchiefs being displayed. You were starting to see sportswear displayed. So they were able to get some leaded glass um, windows in as well as a whole new trim facade around all of the windows. And this was a form of updating the structure at the time. This is a picture from around that time of the old loaning dock in the back at High Street where the annex was. And these were the, um, I think this is the Model A um, that Ford um, trucks that uh, Dead Homes used to use as their livery service for around the um, city. So if you could call at that time or write a letter, they would end up shipping um, the goods to you by carrier. And they had a fleet of them. I think at one time they were operating 35 delivery cars. Um, this is a picture of the Denholm building, 484 um, in the 1930s. On the two sides, the two very ends of the building at one time had big marquees that said uh, the Boston store, which is what it was referred to because it was, you know, many people ask like, was it affiliated with the company, the Boston store? And no, it wasn't. It was because of the way it was such a large department store, one that you would really find in downtown Boston. 
So that's, but those were taken down at that point. It was not referred to as the Boston store much. It was really coming into the Denham K company. This is the new look. Everything changed in 1947 with Christian Dior's uh, new line, which came from Paris, which is very reminiscent of the piece I have on the mannequin behind me, where it was after the war and fashion was changing. You know, the silhouettes, it was a very sloped shoulder. You had a very nipped waist. You know, the emphasis was on the hips and crinolines, you know, and fabric and everything changed. Paris changed the fashion world in the 1940s, late 40s, and it changed retail as a whole, um, whether it be, you know, Filene's with the Parisian shops in downtown Boston, you know, to the way den homes felt. And what they wanted to do was now that the war was over, people were prosperous. They were, you know, going back to work, you know, whether it be working for municipalities or jobs, they wanted to grow their clientele. Um, and they wanted to get a younger clientele going. They started using the term den homes, uh, no apostrophe, going forward as a reference because they wanted a younger demographic. In planning the facade change, um, Harry Wolf, who is Pat Wolf's father, um, who is basically my Denholm's mentor and best friend, um, they wanted to revolutionize what shopping would be like in downtown Worcester. You know, um, what was in vogue in the 1870s with Victorian or federal architecture was really falling out of fashion at that time. And the Art Moderm style was the most prevalent form of architecture um, in the country. So, they ended up looking at the Shilitos building, which is in Cincinnati, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places right now. And the facade and the building exist exactly to what you see from this historic photo to this day. And, you know, the Art Modern style was narrow horizontal windows, um, and that allowed the retailers on the inside to be able to have more retail selling space. Um, a horizontal design, you saw lighter up above materials on the upper floors, and then the buildings were usually weighted in a darker, in a granite or a marble, which, you know, when we get to the Denholm building, I can explain that, and some chrome detail accents. Art Modern came right after Art Deco um, and right before mid-century. Um, so you kind of had this in-between design style, which was a little bit more streamlined, less ornamentation, you know, and it was all more about the form and the function working together for these structures in commercial real estate. This is um, from 1949. This was a quick sketch that H.E. Davidson, um, who was an architect out of Boston, Mass., um, was hired to do the facade change for the building. Now, there were a couple reasons why they did the facade change. One, they wanted it to look more modern for downtown Worcester. Two, by bumping out the entire building an additional two feet to match where the center column of the old building was, allowed them to, you know, bump out and move all of the um, back of house for the storage rooms to be upfront located by the departments. At one time, they were all located way back on High Street. So if an associate wanted to get you know, a garment for a customer and it wasn't on the floor, they would have to run halfway across the building to get it. This way, every department across the front of the building was able to have an adjacent stock room handy for them. And you can see, you know, what I was saying, the horizontal narrow banding of the windows. Um, they added the marquee, the steel marquee, which was all done in brushed anodized aluminum. Um, and what some people think is black granite, the whole base of it is actually a black Belgian marble um, for the whole exterior. And, you know, some of these details still exist on the structure. 
Um, this is uh, the top left is a picture of when they first started to do demolition and the center tower came down and the, oh, sorry, and the fencing across the top, which is known as a parapet. That was an ornamentation detail. And you can see, sorry, um, that they start, were starting to erect scaffolding. In the bottom right, picture, you can kind of get a sense of like what we all, you know, remember as den homes. Um, and you can see how they've been able to kind of get the upper floors done and they were working down on the facade. Um, and, you know, just the, all the scaffolding they had, all of the mobile um, exterior um, structures that were put up to be able to do this because when the building was renovated in 1984, um, Craig Heath and Associates actually tried to salvage the original facade, but because the building had been bumped out, there was virtually nothing left to it. And that's how they know, you know, what was actually happened with the facade during these change, changes. This is an up close detail of the facade and you're seeing the stainless steel marquee which ran over the window displays. And that was designed so that during inclement weather, if it was raining, you could stop and look at the window displays. It was also heated uh, over the two entrances. Um, originally the building had three entrances. The middle entrance was removed during this um, to be able to give more space to cosmetics, which was a ever growing department. But the facade consisted of Indiana limestone, anodized aluminum and um, Belgian marble. And, you know, and the fluting on the sides, on the end caps and in between the two banks of windows um, was also a design detail. Uh, this was the press photo from 1951. You see a bustling downtown. Um, to the right of the building, you may notice that there was that original structure with the women's shop, a children's shop, fabric, um, and there were lawyers up there. That building only lasted one more year after the facade change, and that was eventually demolished and Kresge's was put up. You know, but it also, I, I think this is one of my most favorite pictures of Den Homes because it really captures the early 1950s, the hustle and bustle of downtown Worcester, you know, the beautiful sense of design that we were going through, whether it be automobiles, fashion, home design was radically changing into a more modern era during that time. And the store actually, you know, it was a, as the mayor, A.B. Holmes, Holmstrom, I believe, um, put penned in a, a article in the 1951 in the Telegram and Gazette um, that this was a welcome addition to the new downtown Worcester, which at the time people were getting nervous about because it was aging in appearance compared to other metropolitan cities. When we talk about Christian Dior, you know, it was called the new look. Well, Den Holmes did a window at that time for the big change, a uh, new look, um, a charming new look, curvaceive, feminine, fair, and younger. Um, you know, everyone in the retail industry at that time was really playing off what was going in Paris. And those designs were being knocked off by American designers you know, so that it could be brought down to a Worcester market shopper at their price point. Here's the letter. Uh, Dear Mr. Wolf, as a Main Street neighbor, sharing with you an active interest in clean cut techniques of administration, I extend to you and your company my warm commendation on your newly modernized store. The new exterior of your building right across the street from my city hall office window is a fine one. I like this design very much. You are to be congratulated too on the gains made in the interior. These constructive changes represent a very real community asset in the enhanced appearance of our downtown area and in the visible inspiration thus given for civil self-respect. As a company that has served for 81 years, you are vitally effectively the adage, 
vitalized effectively the adage, whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. And, you know, besides the facade change, one thing that Harry Wolf also did to coincide with this, sections of the store on the interior were renovated as well. Originally, um, you had the center entrance and it was there was a dividing wall on the first floor between the two other entrances. He ended up taking that down and doing an open concept floor plan for the entire first floor. He also relocated millinery at that time up to the second floor from the first floor and gave a brand new millinery salon, which at that time was also a very popular business as every woman was wearing hats, um, as well as a new bridal salon on the third floor. This is just a photo of the facade showing it in 1965 with the flagpoles on the building. Um, the flagpole on the right always had the um, flag, the Scottish flag um, flying. And that was because Mr. Denholm and Mr. McKay were from Scotland. So they always tried to keep that heritage going um, through the building, but you can see on the top right, you have um, the Denholm sign painted. Um, we're starting, I'm starting to see when I go by the building, it's a bit of a ghost sign as the paint is starting to wash away and it needs a repaint job. You're starting to see that sign come through again. And my one goal is to eventually have that um, restored back onto the building and repainted. In 1963, Harry Wolf decided that he was gonna take and renovate the high street and relocate the loading dock underneath between the two buildings on, I think it's called Chase Avenue um, running between. And that would have been on the backside of like Richard Healy and Walgreens. And he wanted to renovate and he wanted to expand the children's department to the back of High Street, be able to expand all of the departments as, you know, this is when the company was really thriving um, during, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s were very prosperous. And so what they acquired was to the right of it, you're gonna, you see a little structure, um, which was actually a residence of a former lawyer. Den Holmes acquired that. And during the hurricane of 1953, housed a lot of people who came from Great Brook Valley um, at the time to give them some shelter, but they primarily used it for when salesmen would come to visit, they would have a residence that they could go to. And next to that on the right was the former YWCA building, which they ended up taking down because at that time during the 50s and the 60s, Suburbia was growing. People were going out of town to do shopping because malls were popping up. Denholms knew that they had a parking issue. They had the parking garage, which they helped fund on Pleasant Street, but it wasn't enough. So they really needed both areas. And so unfortunately, because I love history, uh, the former Y building was partially torn down during this. But I love this picture of the high street entrances. You know, you see these fabulous cars with the tail fins um, and, and a lot of people who went to school at Fanning across the street would comment about the trees that they remember that signal Christmas to them when they would see the trees on the backside of Den Homes going up. Also, H.E. Davidson, the same architect who did the front of the building renovation, also did the backside of the renovation, the high street. And this was the former uh, YWCA building. Presently, right now, you only have the ground level remaining and you can still see the window, oh, sorry, the windows at that time, um, those are still in existence. Um, they did keep the building to the right of it, um, which I'll show a photo after as that was where the former Y swimming pool was. And they ended up expanding the teen departments into that space, as well as moving all the buying offices, the fashion buying offices into there. The notions department relocated into that building um, 
because still people were making their own clothing, um, home furnishings at the time. So fabric departments were a very common entity in department stores at that time still. So this was the new modernized structure um, behind the two mannequins. You see the new glass entrance, which opened up from the parking lot um, that they had just built um, back there. And then the men's varsity shop, which was a younger men's shop, which would carry like, you know, London fog raincoats and, you know, skinny ties. And, you know, I actually have some blazers which I've acquired over the years that say on the inside, Denholm's Varsity Shop. So this was their younger men's department where the men's suiting and furnishings were still on the main street level um, on the right hand first floor. They also inquired the they um, added up expanding the gourmet shop um, and that held a lot of things like gourmet foods and, you know, jams and jellies and chocolates at the time. They had Russell Stover chocolates, which nowadays are very commonplace. At the time, that was a luxury chocolate only sold to the finest department stores, um, as well as if people remember S.S. Pierce was a large manufacturer and they had a large, um, you know, Epicure uh, world there. So you could stop in and get things for dinner or a hostess gift, you know. Um, and I was very lucky to find the gourmet shop sign and I have it hanging in my office as well, uh, completely restored. I, when a tenant went out a few years ago, they had kept it because Den Homes meant a lot to this tenant. And so I was able to find it in the back room. And so, you know, I was able to acquire that. So, you know, it's kind of funny how things work nowadays. Like, you know, I'm, whenever I'm at the building, I'm scurrying every square inch. And this space presently is being renovated into um, apartments and housing. And so I contacted them, but unfortunately nothing had been left after Foothills Theater uh, um, vacated the space. In 1963, uh, Mr. Wolf also opened up the store with the new escalators called the Escalators, uh, made by Otis Company. And they were a thin profile glass enclosure. The panels were hand screened in Paris and flown over um, to the city and everyone had to fit within a quarter of an inch. In fact, they did, Pat tells me about they had one installation issue where one glass was made too small and just about all the things that they had to do to retrofit the escalator to fit that piece. Um, these are the first escalators in Worcester. They are still in the building, still operating. Um, and this was, you know, a big structural feat too because they were taking a building that was built in 1882 and they had to put all new structural supports throughout the building. And the reason why, if you remember in Den Homes, it, for floors one through three are the glass escalators because that's what that building could support. It couldn't take the support of going all the way up to the, sixth, uh, the fifth floor at the time. So that's why they were bumped back on the third floor to go access floors three to five. And you would have accessed it from women's sportswear and it would have taken you up to furniture, you know, and then up to the um, fifth floor. Um, but these were, you know, the most modern thing. There's a sign on the left-hand photo welcoming people to their new moving stairs. Um, and this is the executive office at the time. Uh, Mr. Corsini in the middle, um, Laura, uh, McLaughlin, I can't remember some of their names, it's been a while, Mr. Corsini, who um, came after Mr. Wolf as the vice president, but this was something, you know, that they were very proud of. And like I said, for most people in Worcester, this is their first experience on an escalator. His uh, third floor, um, this was the one that I was talking about by um, Mrs. Sportswear. This one was more of your traditional shape where the sides by the arms were thicker and they could run the motors and everything. These are also still 
in existence, working, you know, in the building. And here's just a small, you know, little side advertisement for the escalators that they ran in the telegram. This is what Den Homes looked like in 1964 on the first floor. And you can see, you know, with the advance of cosmetics, you know, that world was really growing. You know, what Mr. Wolf did for the exterior, you'll see as Mr. Corsini took over operations after Mr. Wolf's passing in 1966, that's where the interior of the first floor got a major overhaul and restoration. But this is very, a very typical color palette of light aquas, beiges, taupes, you know, pops of berry colors that were very popular during the early 60s in um, commercial and residential um, design. You'll also notice the round columns um, of varying widths um, on the first floor. These, some of these were had to be added for the new escalators going in. This is in 1971 when Mr. Corsini had um, hold of the building. And you can see he boxed in all the columns. Um, it was like a melamine uh, laminate, you know, um, in a wood grain with for um, four karat gold um, trim molding put up around them. He wanted a more modern formal appearance. At this time, they knew that Worcester Center, um, you know, was obviously being planned and simultaneously opened. And so Den Holmes knew that they had to, you know, go up against a new Filene, a new Jordan Marsh coming into town. And so they updated the main floor and they ended up laying down a Persian rug, the Karistan, the Carmen Persian rugs. And that was the entire first floor. And many associates had told me that when they walked in, they thought it was the most glamorous thing that they had ever seen to have a whole Persian uh, rugs, you know, go throughout the whole entire main floor. Um, they added the chandeliers. The chandelier that you see hanging is presently the one hanging at the Worcester Club, um, the country club, Worcester Country Club, I should say, that's still hanging there. They acquired it when the building closed, um, as well as some people still have remnants of this rug because after the store closed, they did a closing sale and they cut it up and it was sold for a dollar a yard um, for the Persian rugs. But Mr. Corsini also went through and refaced all of the case lines in the store um, to match the columns. And like I said, just to give it a more structured look. This is a picture looking back with handbags on your right, uh, on your left was cosmetics and then the jewelry bar. And in the back was women's shoes. And you can see this one was done during the Italian event. That was a fortnight that the store held where they transformed the store into like with Italian uh, bakery and cappuccino um, salon. And then they had, um, you know, Italian goods brought in um, and they tied in with the Italian Trade Commission to have um, exclusive goods brought into the building for this time. Um, but if anyone goes into the building now, where you're standing is looking into where the um, post office and dress for success are now. It's virtually unrecognizable when you go into the building now that this existed at the time because there's been so much demolition of the original architecture that was used as a department store in order to retrofit the first floor for new retail tenants. This is a close-up of the um, Persian rug. And, you know, I was, I never found out about this until I was writing the book. I had known that they had recarpeted the first floor, never knew what carpet it was. And when I was doing my, um, you know, uh, basically kind of doing my, um, taking notes of everything I could find going through the company's history, I found this rug and, and found out that this is what they used. And it's just so weird because when I worked at Jordan Marsh and I worked in, I was the creative director at one time with Jordan Marsh and we had this rug at, um, for sale in the rug department. And 
I was always drawn to this rug for some reason. And I used to use this rug for multiple different, you know, furniture setups and window displays. And it was just kind of shocking to me to find out the rug I loved was the whole first floor of Den Homes at one time. People remember as a child shopping downtown Worcester. I mean, it was vibrant. Everything was lit up downtown, you know, from the early days with the garlands going across the streets with the lighted bells to lighted trees on all of the um, street posts. Um, and so holidays in downtown Worcester were really big. And, you know, the company had done some things over the years, and but they were never really spectacular. And so in 1954, Harry Wolf took um, Eric Hallback, who was the creative director for Den Homes, out on Franklin Street. And he said, I want my store to scream Christmas. And so they were both in New York and they went by Macy's who had just relit the whole front of their facade. And they actually copied what Macy's was doing in Herald Square and brought a piece of that back. Um, the Tree of Lights, which is what it was called, was 2,500 bulbs. It was 80 feet tall with a 12 foot star. And this was designed by the display department as well as Coughlin Electric. Ted Coughlin, before his passing, told me many, many stories about how they figured out how they could do this tree on the building, how it would, could withstand high winds, you know, and also, you know, how they could adapt and modify it over the years. And um, Bob Branzik, who's still alive and did the creative for Den Homes, told me, you know, it started off clear for a few years and then they would change it up and it'd be all red one year or they would do it green and white or red and white. Um, but for many people, this tree signified the start of the shopping season in downtown Worcester, where families would get together for Thanksgiving. It was always illuminated Thanksgiving evening, um, but many people would get in the family car and drive to downtown Worcester to drive Main Street, look at the window displays and to look at the Den Home facade and see it all lit up for the holiday season. This photo is actually one of my favorites and it was given to me by a woman who worked in the post office. Her father, her, her father-in-law actually, um, took photos one night in the um, mid 50s of downtown Worcester. And so this is what downtown Worcester in the mid 1950s looked like. Um, this is a picture of the first floor, again, where the post office dress for success is, but just to show how a typical fashion of how, you know, they would go overboard with the layering of holiday, you know, of the stores. This year, it was a very traditional theme uh, with red grow grain padding out the columns with the cherubs and the, um, you know, the swags of greenery um, tying up to chandeliers. Uh, another year, they would do maybe an ice theme where they projected, um, they had mirrors put on the columns and they would project falling ice onto them. And they had, um, you know, they made it look like it was an ice cave when you walked in with icicles pouring from the ceiling, you know. So every year was a different trim at Den Homes. And this was all done in-house by the display team. Here is one of the shots of, you know, the um, ice, um, you know, again, the chair was reused, but the whole entire first floor looked like it had been encrusted in an ice cave. Uh, this is a window display from 1952, 1954, I apologize. And, you know, typical fashion uh, gifting at the time for women was lingerie, house robes. You know, a lot of the imagery that I have for the old windows back in the 50s at holiday time focused around lingerie, perfume, um, house coats, slippers. And so this is what, you know, uh, your merrier Christmas store. Again, all props were made in-house. Um, they had their own in-store sign painter who would hand paint all of the signage that you see. Um, 
but it's just a very typical 1950s window display. Um, this one's a little bit more updated. This was from the 1960s, where they ended up closing down the windows. These are called prosciniums, and they were covered in boxwood wrapped in like uh, metallic garlands. Uh, but you can see like they've got a silver go-go boot hanging, you know, on the rack with the mannequin uh, next to the mannequin with the antlers. Um, but, you know, on the right hand side, it says this is Den Homes, your friendly gift store um, for fashion and value. Um, you know, every year they would do something different. They would also bring in the animatronics um, for the children to be amused by. So everything, you know, kind of moved or whatever. Um, this photo of the exterior was done in 1971. Um, the original Tree of Lights was actually getting worn out and they want, Mr. Corsini wanted something different. So you can see over the main entrance, the new Den Homes logo, which is what most of us are familiar with, with that, you know, jaunty font. Um, and he decided to erect that on the building to unify the two stores together because Auburn had that as their facade sign over the entrances. But he ended up going with three simpler trees, um, which were up until the store closed in 1973. Um, the original Tree of Lights, if anyone remembers, when the store closed, the former Tom McCann bought the Tree of Lights, ended up restoring it and had it on Tom McCann. So when you were on 290 driving by, you could see the old Den Homes lights were up on the building. But another thing I love about this picture is I remember as a child, these big lit, uh, lighted snowflakes hanging from all of the um, lampposts. And I used to always love them. They were so large and just illuminated and warm, you know, but this is what uh, downtown Worcester looked like, you know, in 19, early 1970s. This is a photo of the third floor in the dress department. Um, decked out for the holidays. This was done in the 1960s, late 60s. And this was all when my grandmother and Mr. Corsini went to New York. The big retailer at the time that everyone was following was Bloomingdale's. And Bloomingdale's had kind of redone their whole Lexington Avenue store. And they modeled it after Carnaby Street in London because that was the most fashionable shopping place um, where everyone was going to. And so what they decided to do was break down the store into individual boutiques versus large departments. And so Den Homes came back and they ended up doing the same thing. And this is one of the boutiques that they did where they pulled um, product from around the entire store, focused on a theme, um, this one, you know, holiday gifting, whatever, um, it could have been sequins. And so they pulled all these items together in this gift boutique. So a husband could go in, find something for his wife, have it wrapped, you know, and ready to go. So everything was just easier for the customers. Another shop that they did was the Place on Three mod shop was all geared towards the whole go-go boot, the mod movement that was happening in fashion, the mini skirts, you know, a lot of these shops came into play right around this time. Uh, this is a photo of one of the animatronic uh, windows that they had where everything was mechanical, everything would move. And, you know, this is what we still do in retail nowadays in the larger stores. They still have these windows geared towards um, the younger, you know, the children. Um, you know, to appease them. And, you know, when the kids would look at the window and then they were able to get, it was an inflatable balloon that would have, you know, um, whether it be a squirrel, Rocky the squirrel on the inside, they would use popular figures at that time. And the children could take that away with a candy cane after looking at these. But also when the building closed, this whole setup of all of these animatronics was sold to People's Bank and they used to display them in the lobby of People's Bank until they ended up closing. The fashions at Den Holmes, you know, 
when you get into a department store, your most profitable profitable departments are always women's cosmetics, perfume, and women's ready to wear. That's where you have your greatest margins, that's where you have your greatest sales. And so the third floor and the first floor were always the two floors that were constantly being updated, modernized, because um, cosmetics and perfume shoes were on the first floor. But on the third floor, you had women's millinery, you had the blouse department, you had the sweater department, you had better dresses, sportswear, suits, furs, everything, the bridal salon, evening shop. And so, you know, Denholm's, the third floor played a major exist, um, played a major role in the success of the overall store. Uh, this is a millinery window from the 1960s featuring hats for Easter time, uh, millinery windows, you know, no one wears hats anymore, but at one time, like I said, everyone was wearing hats. You buy a new hat, for a special occasion or for a certain holiday, you know, whether it be Christmas, you know, a christening, you know, um, Easter, whatever, or just the launch of spring because styles were changing from wide brim to pillbox in the 1960s to fedoras, you know, um, millinery was always changing, but this is a window that they had done on Main Street this is the millinery salon, which was up on the third floor, uh, right before the escalator up would have been on the opposite side of this wall, along with the, the blouse bar that I was talking about. This was a window display done in, the, in 1970 um, when Zsa, Zsa Gabor was launching her fragrance line and she ended up making a personal appearance at Den Homes. And so these are, this was in the vestibule. When you walked into Den Homes, you walked through one set of doors and there was a revolving door ahead, but there were two display windows, one on either side. Um, they ended up taking over those two windows as well as part of the main floor, the perfume department and did everything around Zsa, Zsa Gabor's packaging, her colors, everything. So when she came into the store, it was really like a launch for her, um, her new fragrance line. Uh, this is a window display back in the mid 1960s, showing uh, the popularity of, you know, fabrics were changing at this time, silhouettes were changing, hemlines were going up, then they were coming down a bit, you know, as we were going towards the 70s. Um, so this was a uh, window display at that time. The mannequins that they used at Den Homes were what luxury department stores were using at the time. It was a vendor called D.G. Williams, um, who was a very popular mannequin sculptor at the time. And they would buy a new fleet of mannequins once a year, and that would adapt to the new body changes. You know, if people, people weren't corseted, you know, were wearing Meadow, Merry Widows at this time, like they were in the 1950s. So the waistline was a little bit more natural. Shoes would come down and in heel height. And so the mannequins had to reflect that. And I was very lucky to acquire uh, old Denholm's D.G. Williams mannequin when I was in a, the Cambridge Antique Market. I ended up spotting it in the corner and was able to save it and have it restored. So I also, I have one of these in my collection as well. This was the dress department on the third floor um, as it looked um, at, in the late 60s. And if you see in the middle, you see the mannequins on the far right, and then in the very middle would have been the Salisbury shop, which a lot of people might remember. That was almost like Den Holmes Couture Salon, and that would carry like Kimberly Knits, it had Ole Gassini, um, it would have St. John, um, and so that was more their upscale line, which they always tried to promote as well. And then you had budget dresses, you had fashion dresses, evening shop, but this is the down escalator from the third floor if you're looking straight ahead to your left. And behind that is where, if anyone remembers, you used to bring your garments and they would have them, um, that was the register and the wrapping area where you would check out um, for your purchases up in that department. 
Oh, and I also was able to acquire, I had the pedestal and I'm looking at it right now and the cherub statue that was on the platform um, on your far right next to the mirrored column. I was also able to um, acquire that piece as well from if anyone remembers Sirocco, that was a popular line back in the 60s of home decor. That was a line. And luckily, mine still has the Den Homes price tag on the inside. That retailed for $36 at the time. Uh, this was a window display to tie in with the um, 1967 Olympics at the time. And so this was a Grecian theme that they did. Um, no, this was the Greek Odyssey event, I'm sorry, um, that tied and it celebrated um, the country of Greece where they had products flown in for it. They had the minister at that time um, come in, do a personal appearance. Um, but, you know, they brought in pottery, fashion, you know, um, home decor, as well as traditional um, Grecian outfits. Uh, this is some of the popular fashions. This is my grandmother on the left, uh, Josephine Carboni, and she headed up all, she started in Den Homes as a stock girl in 1947 and worked her way up to vice president um, in by the time the store closed. Um, so it was quite an achievement. In fact, a lot of the papers were writing about it at the time that they would report when she was traveling to Europe to do the buys for Den Homes, um, you know, when she was going to Italy, doing these special events. Um, but on the right, she would also, you know, design some of the fashion shows. Um, some of the people, uh, you know, who worked in the store were also integral to these fashion shows. A lot of the employees were the ones who modeled them, assembled these, you know, but um, at the time fashion was very coordinated. This was a slice in time right before the casualization of America with the whole hippie movement coming into play. So this is really the last era, it was 1966, where women were still wearing like the kitten heels, you know, the bouffants were still really big. You know, it was a little bit more formal in appearance. And then you started to see with the adaptation of new fabrics, polyester, you know, everything slowly after 1966 started to change. Um, these are some other, you know, popular fashions. This was on the right. The Keyhole bus line was very popular um, in 1967. Um, so we have the model wearing it on the right. And on the left, um, we have um, this model wearing uh, the popular caftans, which were coming into play. So this is the change between 1966 and 1967, because you're starting to see a little bit more of a bohemian worldly influence on what's happening to fashion versus London and Carnaby Street. And this is the book that Pat and I wrote together, um, you know, I've always had a passion for Den Home since I was a kid. Um, and I've been collecting things ever since I was 13. And never really knowing where anything would go. And I remember I started a blog back in 2009 on Den Homes when blogging really first became popular. And I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I find it interesting. I had no idea if there would be an audience or anything. And um, the history press um, actually contacted me. They found my blog and they said, would you ever be interested in writing a book? And I had known Pat because my grandmother would bring me over as a child to meet the Wolf family. And then I went back after my grandmother's death because I wanted to talk to the family and especially Pat because she was the curator for her father's collection of Den Homes, Mr. Wolf's collection. And so we got to talking, obviously instant friends, friends for life. And I was like, would you ever be interested in doing a book? And she wanted to do a book on her own, but 
it's hard, you know, when you don't have time and she was bu busy, you know, starting to restore Wolfcrest. And so we each broke it up and, you know, I, it was so much fun. I had never written anything in my life. And to be able to do the research on the building, I, I mean, I talked with, I can't even tell you how many former employees. Um, I'm very lucky some of them, you know, were still living at the time. And then uh, the Telegram and Gazette gave me um, all rights to their archive. I was able to go through um, Marvin Richmond's collection and, um, oh my goodness, now I'm forgetting the other, George Cocaine's collection of photographs. He was uh, another popular uh, Worcester photographer who documented a lot of more at the turn of the century. And Miss Marvin Richmond came in really towards after that in the forties, you know, to the end of Den Holmes. And so to be able to go through their collections as well, as well as the historical society. And so, you know, I was so lucky to have all of this stuff around me and I was able to kind of put the pieces together the best that I could at that time. Now, since then, I have learned a couple, you know, tidbits and things, you know, nothing that changes the history of the company, but it's just future facts, which, you know, I wish I had had at that time to include in. But, you know, we ended up at one time, this was the most, the best selling book that the history press had. And I think to this date, this is still one of the most popular department store books that um, it's now acquired by Acadia. Um, who does a lot of other department stores as well. You'll find Marshall Fields and everyone. But it was great to hear that, you know, this was the number one book at the time. And, you know, hopefully after and things calm down a bit, um, I think we'd love to get together and do another book together on what shopping in downtown was like. When we can talk about the other stores that surrounded Den Homes, because it wasn't just Den. I mean, Worcester was a downtown. It was a destination. And you had great stores like Richard Healy, Lujan's, you had Fine Leeds, Kennedy's, Jordan Marsh, American Supply. You know, before that it was Scherer's. Um, I'm just so Eaton's, you know, Learner's. There were so LL, LL um, now I'm forgetting the name on Front Street next to Woolworth's to the left of it, but you know, Worcester was a completely different place. It was a reflection on where the country was at the time and when people were still living in downtown cities. You know, it's nice to see it coming back a bit, but it always gives me great pleasure when I'm able to go through the history of the city. And I think by doing a future book, it'd be a lot of fun for everyone to remember those memories as well. But. That's it, you know, and also this was the old blog spot, um, you know, that I had, which started all of this. Right now, everything has been moved to Facebook, to the Den Holmes Facebook page. And so anyone has access. It was a private page before, but I wasn't able to keep up with, you know, the backlog of people wanting to be accepted. So um, the Worcester Heritage Society with Julie Dowen ended up creating the new page on Facebook. So anyone can join. I'm constantly updating. The, um, the collection is constantly growing. In fact, I'm just gonna show, because it just received in the mail today. Um, this is what I was just able to acquire. This is a 1967 Christmas catalog um, from Den Holmes at the time. So I kind of paid good, big bucks on eBay for this, but, you know, I want people to find me. Um, I hope I have the link in the next slide. I don't, I apologize, um, but it's Den Holmes one at Yahoo. And um, that um, Den Holmes one at Yahoo is a great way to contact me. If anyone has information on, of, regarding Den Holmes uh, memorabilia, what I'm looking for mostly at this point are catalogs, signage, fixtures, photographs. I have, you know, many um, items from the store. Um, those are the things I just don't have the space for right now because I'm kind of taking over multiple locations with the collection because it's grown so much. But um, again, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can reach me out there at Den Holmes. 
uh, the History Museum, as well as denholmes1 at yahoo.com. And I just cannot thank you guys enough, you know, for having me on and letting me speak about Dan Holmes, a subject I'm extremely passionate about, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, just looking at the old photos and seeing the old displays, uh, I remember going through the store uh, with my, uh, my grandmother and my mom. And that's why, you know, I love showing it because it brings back memories. Everyone's got their own memories of shopping back then. And a lot of people remember Den Homes, you know, due to the size. But it, you're going to have different memories from someone else. And I just love hearing that it triggers a positive in people because, you know, we all need that right now. Life is so different and so fast, especially with the Internet, that this was a gentler time in history, you know, and in retail, especially. This was, you know, um, like theater um, back in retail back then. I can remember the star outside on the front of the Ten Homes building. It was it was very popular. Exactly. It. So uh, it was very very nice. Oh, thank you. I appreciate thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we're also going to uh, ask that you come back for February twenty fourth, two thousand twenty one. The first first lady, the story of Martha Washington by Ann Barrett. Uh, that will be on Shrewsbury Channels 28 and 328 and shrewsburymediaconnection.org. Thank you very much for coming out tonight.